Yeah. Oh, slide. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Connie Walker. I'm here at the National Optical Astronomy Observatory in Tucson, Arizona, USA. I'm here with Ricky Maciel. Um, and, and do you want to say hello? Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Ricky Maciel. Uh, I work here at the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. I'm also a student at the University of Arizona here in Tucson. I am a senior studying astronomy at the moment. Mm -hmm. And we're here to talk about the Quality Lighting Teaching Kit uh, activity on Claire. And joining us with us today is Mike Chapman from Australia. You want to say hello, Mike? Hi. And you're, at, uh, you're at Solus? Yep, Sydney Outdoor Lighting Improvement Society. <laughs> so we're a little bit like the IDA, um, but different. <laughs> And we're very lucky to have him join us again. He's been on one or two of our other um, hangouts that we've had on the Quality Lighting Teaching Kit. And uh, this is probably our fourth week of doing the Quality Lighting Teaching Kit activities um, on Google Plus Hangout on air. And uh, so today what we'd like to do is to uh, a little bit uh, remind you, first of all, that there is a question and answer app for all of you who might be viewing. And uh, what you can do is access that Q&A app. Uh, usually it's um, in, in your upper right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, there's like nine squares and three by three configuration. That's the represents, you know, the Google's symbol, basically. And if you click on that, you'll get a couple of apps. And one of those two apps will be on Q&A, question and answers. So and you can use that to type in your question, which we'll get at this end once we access our own uh, Q&A app, and uh, we'll be able to address your questions. So what we're hoping at this point in time is that you have had a chance to look at, um, <clears throat> at the, let's see if I can screen share this, at the um, video, the tutorial video that we have on the uh, Google app, I'm sorry, on the uh, uh, Quality Light Teacher Kit activity called Glare. And, uh, if I'm trying to get the screen share, on the screen share, on the showcase actually, there are two things that we have showcased. And one is uh, on the uh, Quality Learning Teacher Kit webpage, which is on our NOAO site. And if you look at that very briefly, I'm trying to get our apps up back here, which kind of don't come very easily. If you go under showcase, uh, you'll see that we have uh, the first showcase item is on our uh, page, and it is at um, noao.edu slash education slash qltkit.php. It has all the resources you could possibly want on the entire kit, including the Glare activity that you're featuring today, uh, <clears throat> and also the tutorial videos that are at the bottom of the page, one of which is on light pollution and glare. And the other showcase activity, uh, show showcase that we have up there, the URL is on the, the video itself. If you go there, um, you'll gain access to that. And if you go down to, I wonder if we could do that here. Um, but you'll have it there on your showcase app. And uh, it's called Light Pollution and Glare. It's, the, it's about a 12 minute video. It's a very instructive video and it stars this guy here, uh, Ricky Maciel. And uh, we're very lucky to have had him do that. He did a great job. <clears throat> um, so those are the two things I want to point out in your showcase app, um, both the web page with all the, uh, the files on there and also the video, the tutorial video. Because, I mean, it's really a good video on how to do the activity. But what we thought we'd do here just a little bit is to talk to you a little bit about um, what this uh, entire Quality Learning Teacher Kit is about. It really does feature about six different issues. Um, and what happens is that uh, the teacher or the instructor, or if you do this as an after school program, you are the mayor of the city. And then your students that are involved, you can actually group them into six different groups. And they can each pick one of these issues. And today the issue is on glare that we have here. Um, and the activity, we're gonna explain in just a few minutes, but it's based on problem-based learning, they call it in the world of uh, education. And this problem-based learning takes real-life situations and it um, allows the students to explore the problems 
uh, trying to identify the problems and come up with solutions. And so um, Ricky in just a minute or two will explain about that in terms of the light pollution and glare activity. Um, <clears throat> and then, what, so how we start with this is we have a poster actually on issues. And um, I'm going to try to screen share that for you in a minute. Sometimes this little thing doesn't pop up too well. Here we go. Okay, so the issues poster is here. I can screen share that with you. And Ricky, would you um, try to explain that to people here? Sure. So um, again, you're acting as the mayor of a town, um, and your students are the, uh, the citizens of, of this town. And so they, they raise issues um, by sending in letters uh, to you, the mayor. And each, each one of these six subjects has a couple of complaints that have been addressed by the citizens. So if we look at Claire, uh, there's one that says, Dear Mayor, I've lived in the city for my entire life. Um, but not with all your new fangled lights on the streets. So this is about um, the new street lamps and, and what problems those might be causing. Um, unfortunately, that bottom one has a funky script that I can't read too well. <laughs> but yeah, it's in the same vein of, of a complaint. And so the, uh, the end goal is for the, uh, the students using these problem-based learning strategies to come up with uh, some solutions for, for all of these um, issues. And so we have, um, just as a basis of, or a foundation for the students, we have um, what we uh, call, um, well, they're just posters, basically, informational posters on each of the activities. We actually supply about 10 of these posters with the kit, six of which are on the activities. And here's the one on glare. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So um, we just have a few of the uh, most important points about glare bulleted right here in the top left corner of this poster. Um, so we have, uh, let's see, we also have a section on shielding and dimming, which um, is what we want to encourage the students to ultimately come to um, at the end of this activity. Um, we know that shielding and dimming are the best things that we can do with these street lights to prevent glare. So we want to guide them down uh, a path to to the work where they can come to this conclusion. You don't want to give them too much, uh, you know, just, just stepping down that right path of thinking. Um, but moving on from this poster, so we have um, some information about the dangers of glare, um, especially for uh, uh, people with aging eyes. Um, people are much more prone to glaucoma as they age, uh, and this could really, really um, amp up the effects of glare um, in terms of uh, not just discomfort, but disability. Um, let's see, we have a now try this section. Uh, so this is the actual um, activity part. Is, is that right, Connie? Mm -hmm. No, we'll be going over that in a few minutes. Okay, and, and we will be going over that shortly, but um, it, it's bulleted step by step, more or less, um, in, in brief detail. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have a key idea section at the bottom of this. So if your students are interested in this and, and they um, want to find out more about it on their own at home using the internet, um, those are some key phrases that they, that they can Google. Or at school if there's enough time. You know, it depends on sure. what the teacher wants to do. Yeah. Okay. So that's basically where the starting point is because not all students will know, you know anything about light pollution and how it affects the eyes. Um, in, in terms of glare. So um, we'll give them that sort of foundation to start with and then they explore with this activity and if they can online with other um, uh, references that they find and they come to a solution and they bring that solution back uh, as a classroom. So each of the groups will come back and report out just like they would in a city council or to the city council with different task groups uh, that the mayor um, assigns. So, and they come to some basic conclusions, and that's, um, that's the fun part, too. So um, that's the basis of it, and um, I was wondering um, if we could stop here just for a few minutes and see if um, Mike had any questions or any insights or uh, words of wisdom. Oh, I'm fine so far, Connie. It's fine so far? <laughs> okay. Um, well, actually, um, 
with his expertise, I'd like to, after we just go over shortly the activity and wait for some questions from a viewer, um, I'd like to actually um, tap Mike's expertise in, in, uh, in light pollution um, and ask him if he knows anything about an issue uh, that's come out less than a month ago. The AMA, the Amer American Medical Association, uh, had a report on LED lighting. And I think we'd like to talk about that uh, a little bit later. If we um, don't get a million questions, it would be really, really nice if we can um, talk about that a little bit and how that um, connects to this activity here, because a lot of it uh, is, is based on issues of glare. So I'm going to let um, I'm gonna hand it to Ricky for a minute, and he's going to talk about the kit. I'm just going to close the door so that we don't get okay. much noise. Okay. Just gather the materials here. One by one. So, if you look inside your uh, quality lighting teaching kit, you'll find uh, a glare bin, and it's labeled both ends with glare. And if you open it up, you'll find uh, one black flashlight that we call a mag light, um, another flashlight of assorted colors. Uh, <laughs> we have um, some tape measure and ink jet transparencies on a ring. We also have, do, do we include the foil in all of them? No, the yeah, the tube foil over there. OK. And we have, just a moment. Uh, roll of tin foil that's not included inside this box, but in the larger bin. Um, so all of these will be needed for this activity, as well as a glare poster. Um, sorry, not the poster that you just saw earlier in this video, but um, uh, an eye test chart like you would see at. Uh, I can put that up here. Oh, and it's visible right behind me. Let's, let's yeah. right here. This is what you need. Okay. So <laughs> that is what we need to set up. So um, how do you want to do this? Should we run through it and, and yeah. talk about well, just, it as we go? Just a very, very short overview um, of what we're doing. It's the importance of having okay. uh, the transparency, for instance. So what we do with this, uh, this light is someone will stand behind um, at the, uh, the eye chart, and they'll turn on this mag light. Let's see. If we, OK. So you can actually see in this video itself, um, if I point this towards the webcam, you see a glare effect. So that's what we're trying to simulate here. Someone will point this um, almost directly at someone's face. Um, and the goal is to uh, see how far down the eye chart you can read. So you do this once without any, any obstructing light, just to see how far you can go. Uh, then we do this once with um, the mag light shining more or less directly at you. Uh, we, we be careful not to shine directly into the eyes because the oversaturation could be very irritating. But we, uh, we repeat this um, with the light flashing, and, and we see if we can get as far as we did on the first run. Um, and we record how far we go every time. So after we do that, we didn't take a single transparency, and there are four of them on this ring. So we take one at a time, and we hold it up in front of our eyes with the mag, mag light shining on us. And, and this should cause uh, a noticeable glare effect. And again, we go through this and see how far down the eye chart you can go, and you record that. Um, once you've done that with one transparency, you do it with two, and then three, and four. And every step along the way, you want to record how far you can go. And by the time you get to using all four, of these transparencies, uh, you should see a very greatly diminished ability to, to see. What you mean by how far you can go is that you can see from behind uh, behind um, Ricky, there are the eye charts with different line numbers. And what you're supposed to be trying to do at every instance is read what is the smallest line that you could possibly read in whatever condition you have there. We actually do try with the lights on first, but you don't really have to do that. You can actually try it as Ricky suggested with the lights off um, and just 
lighting it like this, and then trying with the mag light like he's talking about. What's that last step, Ricky, that we do, the, the fourth step usually? So you'd have the lights on, mm -hmm. the lights off with this, just the flashlight shining here. Yeah. So that you could actually read it, because you, you won't see it right now with the webcam, but when people are in the room at a distance of 20 feet from the eye chart, they need to, some illumination to read the lines. Um, and then the third instance is with this light on, like you said, and the mag light shining, not in their eyes, because that's really bad, but sort of below the mouth there, you know, towards the throat maybe. Um, so it still shows us some glare when you do the testing with the inkjet transparencies, as, as Ricky was saying. Um, but, it, um, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, um, it'll still have a really kind of, you would see actually starbursts if the, um, if the lighting from the mag light were in the eyes. Um, it, just like you would with uh, cataracts. With cataracts, uh, these old generation get these starbursts sometimes when uh, bright lights are in their eyes. Um, but we really don't want to hurt the kids' eyes, so we're just asking to be below the nose, basically, and not have it in, directed in their eyes. Um, that is the light. But as he was saying, too, one thing that um, I, um, we want to do is when you focus, I don't know if you can see it here, it's really a big beam. You don't want it to use it that way. You want to use it uh, as a tight, um, very intense circle of light. So that's where you want to leave this when you're shining it below the person's nose that's uh, trying to read the chart. And uh, it's a very you know, instructive activity for kids because kids have, they're so young, they don't know anything about how it is to have cataracts. And, um, and we found of all the materials that we used that these inkjet transparencies, which are rough on one side and uh, smooth on the other, they are enough to um, sort of provide that What's that term we found? In the AMA paper, there's a term called veiling illumination. Veiling illumination. Yeah. Veiling illumination. And that's really a kind of an accurate description if you really think about it, because there's just a layer of light, basically, that uh, obscures your ability to, for, for, to contrast, to really see contrast. And so um, to really define detail when you have a glare, you know, kind of from um, uh, Making you making it unable for you to view as well as you could without glare. So um, it's really a great term, veiling illumination. I think. Um, anyway, so that really does a good job, especially when you have four layers. You'll be amazed at uh, how much less you can. You, know, you can't read this in terms of the smaller numbers, so you have to go towards like three and two by the time you're done um, in those situations. But the the fourth one, the, you know, so we have. Lights on, lights off with the flashlight. Light, and the third one is lights off with the flashlight and the mag light. And the fourth one situation is, do you remember? Oh, okay. So at this point, we want the uh, the students to uh, come all together and, and brainstorm different solutions. And so um, this is where the foil comes in handy. You want to give them the foil and, and really anything else that you might have in the fossil may you think would be useful for for shielding. Um, what they can do and uh, what I've done in the past is I've taken a bit of foil and let's see it's not too well defined here but this acts as a cap so see the mag light real quick so I put this on the end of the mag light so that it covers all sides including the front and it only allows light to shine down. So if I turn on the mag light real quick, you see there's that bit of glare, and as soon as I shield it, it's, it's reduced enough that it's not so much of an issue. So you want to give the students some time to think about different kinds of solutions. And once you think they found one, you want them to do this again and, and test how far they can go down the eye chart. And now you'll have varying results. Some of them will get it like spot on the first time. Um, at that point, they can um, think about how to uh, explain why it works so well and, and maybe talk to their, their classmates. Um, but if, if they try it and it doesn't work so well, maybe um, you can get another chance to uh, experiment with different methods and, and see what other kinds of um, 
solutions they can come up with. So anyway, um, this is you know this is one of a few different kinds of solutions that students might be able to come up with. There's um, another one where um, teachers and I were talking about um, changing the color of the light. So you're going maybe to you're simulating a condition where you're going to warmer color temperatures in some ways. You're not using a bright white light. You might use a um, one of those clear candy wrappers that might be a pinkish or reddish or or a yellowish color and uh, just wrap it around the light like we did basically with the tin foil around all, uh, most sides with the tin foil, but around all sides with a, with a uh, color trans uh, transparent kind of candy wrapper or something. Um, and, and they come in different cellophanes that way too. Um, so there's different ways to do that. Um, and there's different kinds of solutions of this sort that you can talk about with the students. Um, and I'm sure the uh, kids are pretty bright uh, usually about these things. They come up with their pretty good solutions. Um, and again, this is mostly geared towards kids that are in what we call in the United States middle school grades and a little bit older. Uh, so kids that are in sixth grade or, or about um, starting about year age of 11 to maybe 14 or so or going up to maybe 16 at most. Those are the kind of age ranges where these activities really uh, do a very good job. Um, so that's about it for the explanation of the activities. Can you think of anything else you'd like to add, Ricky? Um, no, no, I think that was just about it. Yeah, we didn't want to take all the time. We wanted to leave most of the time for anything that um, could come up as questions. I'm going to get my seat again here. Um, or um, if you wanted to talk about issues of glare and the latest and greatest from the American Medical Association, which really I think is a great stepping stone, um, stepping stone uh, to um, actually sort of preventative medicine in some ways, uh, and to ensuring that we don't have problems down the road uh, with with our health uh, in terms of um, glare or you know the effects of glare or um, melatonin levels being depleted too much or sleep disorders or the ties to obesity, ties to diabetes even. I've, I've heard uh, links to links to cancer. I mean, there's different things. If you're under light that is cooler lights that are very high temperature lights, and I know this it sounds strange to say that, but uh, the 4,000, 5,000, the really um, um, bright lights, uh, whitish, bluish lights, um, <clears throat> that uh, that first came out as in terms of LEDs. That's what you know. They had lights that were mostly over four thousand Kelvin coming out and being sold uh, widely. Um, and now they're just coming out with the amber uh, colored um, or phosphor colored LEDs, uh, the sort of the filtered lights, um, the FLEDs they call it. Um, and so those are the kind of lights that um, are offering more uh, warmer colors, to call it, although to me it's cooler colors, lower temperature, but it's, they're calling it warmer colors. And um, so you have more uh, narrow band amber LEDs, for instance, which are probably one of the better lights you can possibly get in terms of health issues and things, and actually astronomy, uh, keeping your night, night sky starry. Um, so, uh, these are the considerations that cities um, that might want to consider in the future. Um, and so I don't know if, if uh, we could start with um, Mike, who's been patiently listening to us all talk here. Um, if you would have any words of wisdom in terms of what you've encountered there, being the head of uh, Solus in uh, Sydney, Australia. And in terms of the glare, issues of glare or, or using the activities? <laughs> okay. Um, I guess, uh, like, glare is significant. Is around Australia, I guess it is. Glare has become a significant issue with the LED refits, mainly because they've used the old luminaire shell and just insert it into that the the like the LED array and so they're still using the old drop lenses on the um, on the lights and so that you know spreads the spreads the light out and uh, it 
um, causes causes glare because of the intensity of the LEDs, which right. I was just reading about in the AMA release, <laughs> basically, just chasing it up. Um, there's a section, you know, there's just a little section in here on um, talking about a French report and uh, the concentration of the light in a point source of the LED. Mm -hmm. So that's dangerous when they're using the drop lenses. Um, now they need to have full cutoff, basically. That's right. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, so they're, they're not fully shielded. The, the Cobra lens is, um, for those of you who are not quite as familiar, uh, instead of, like he was saying, instead of being fully cut off, it, it goes below the fixture. So the fixture is up here, and the Cobra lens is dipping down. And so the bulb, the light source is actually exposed. And that's sort of the, the worst of circumstances when it comes to glare. Um, you want something that is, you know, it has... Um, metal or whatever, you know, opaque <laughs> uh, shielding is available for um, as much as the light as possible so that um, the light is, is embedded in that shield uh, and not exposed. And you want to see the effect of the light on the ground. You don't want to see the source of the light. That's and right. If yeah. You can, yeah, if you can uh, possibly minimize that or nullify that, then you've uh, really uh, gone a long way to to solving your problem in terms of glare. So that's really, really important. And what I really, um, I was really amazed at the AMA report. I really, I did think a lot of it was a, a very, has some very wise words of wisdom in terms of, uh, um, well, they talked about the 4,000 Kelvin lights and, um, and maybe you can find the numbers on how much of that? I think it was like, was it 29% or more? It was 29%, yeah. 29% of all the light came out in the white, well, in the blue light. And we see it, our eyes see it as white light, so sort of glaring white light. And if you lowered it down to 3,000 Kelvin light, then that drops to 21%, was it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, so it's a great reduction, but the efficiency of the lights, this is what really pretty cool, only dropped 3% from the 4,000 to the 3,000. So the light was still, at 3,000 Kelvin, was still almost as efficient as the 4,000 Kelvin, but you had a great reduction in the amount of blue light um, that was, um, that your eyes saw. And it's really, I mean, it's really important to understand that it's the blue light because, um, I mean, there's a lot to throw at some people that are not as, familiar with this, but um, blue light is what they call shorter wavelength light. So the shorter wavelength is like having, um, I think of light in terms of sizes of the packets of energy that's coming at you. They call those packets of energy photons. And for light, blue light, they're, to me, small. They're smaller entities than, than red, or, uh, red photons. So these small, uh, small photons, uh, tend to scatter more. They tend to be able to, um, to me, sort of bounce off things more and, and scatter in the atmosphere. And uh, because of the scattering, we have um, our eyes uh, see that veil, that veiling illumination, that um, sort of light that is, is uh, obliterating the, your ability to contrast and to see details as, as well as you could have otherwise without the glare, so without the scattering in the atmosphere, um, or in our eyes, I should say. And um, and so that uh, blue light does that a whole heck of a lot more than the uh, longer wavelength lights like red light. And that's why it's, it's another great reason to opt for the 3,000 caliber or even lower, 2,700 if you can go that low. Uh, for, for the temperature of the light um, that you could use as a street light in your city. So this is really, really important to, to consider these, uh, these issues um, in terms of your own health and in terms of minimizing glare. Um, do, you, do you have any more thoughts on that, Mike? Um, I might just add that uh, 2700 Kelvin, um, a light that 
we use in Solus to to exhibit basically has about ten percent blue in it. It's down to ten percent. Wow. Yeah. Well, this particular light um, is ten percent blue, and I think the IDA has more or less said that's the minimum that they're aiming for. But in reality, if you were doing like a dark sky park or something like that, you might be going for two and a half percent blue, which is the PC amber. Oh yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, do you know? Can you tell the public any more about the PC amber LEDs or the narrowband amber LEDs? Uh, well, you know, PC means phosphor coated, mm -hmm. um, and so these are basically LEDs that are phosphor coated to produce amber light. And so actually a white light that has the phosphor coating on it, just like a, the fluorescent lights have phosphor coatings on them, right? Yeah, yeah, similar, mm -hmm. yeah. And there's no filtering there as the, in the narrow band? No, no, no filtering, just straight up phosphor on the LED. Yeah. Okay, all right. And how does that contrast with the narrow band amber? LEDs. Um, yeah, good question. You're probably leading me a little bit out of what I know exactly, but um, I think there are like there are amber LEDs themselves. They're actually much much lower. They're down around eighteen hundred K, which I think is probably somewhere where low precious sodium is as well. Um, and so you get like a very green light coming out of them, um, which in fact is where the eye is most efficient. Um, but there's not really much color addition. Oh, really? Because I thought it was like sixty percent or something. I, I thought it had. So you have the scale for. Uh, well, no, no, you might, but sixty is probably. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people would find that uncomfortable. Um, but you know that's pretty much uh, personal personal choice, I think. Um, so your your personal choice is for the phosphor coated amber LEDs, then? Or? Yeah. Well, I'm colorblind, so oh. <laughs> it's a bit odd, right? <laughs> so I'm not sure, right? Um, I only I only know the numbers. <laughs> Okay. Well, but good. often, you know, the, the only reason people want the like the high color rendition is basically for security camera. Um, right. I mean, life is a compromise, even with with lighting. I mean, you, yeah. Uh, if you had a, a car sales lot, for instance, you wouldn't want all your cars to look gray under the low pressure sodium lights, for instance, you'd want a little more color rendition. So just so how many, people, how many people shop for a car at night? Um, I'm just trying, I'm trying to give an example. That's what I was trying to. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> but uh, I mean, there are certainly security cameras that can cope with the low CCTs and still give color rendering. So low CC, you know, a low color temperature shouldn't be a problem for a security camera. So how do you explain to the, how would you explain to the public what color temperature really is? Uh, well, color temperature is just uh, like a position on the black body curve. Yeah, but lots of people don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I need to get some warning before to 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 uh, to explain uh, to give it my best shot. But um, there's a basically there's a color gamut, and color is measured by on you know several parameters, and um, the you know, the color gamut has this sort of weird shape to it. And depending where you are in this color gamut, basically tells you what your CCT is, I think. It's been a little while since I um, studied that. So. Well, at least where it heats, right? Temperature. That's, getting, that's getting too technical, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so 
I was just thinking of any other issue. We had, this, this report was only about five pages long from the American Medical Association. Uh, but um, it, really, it really touched on some pretty basic things. And although it didn't really have metrics per se, um, it did have some metrics. It did compare 4,000 Kelvin lights to 3,000 Kelvin lights, for instance, in terms of um, uh, efficiency and how much light came out in the blue. But um, in terms of, and it cited very, they told you how many studies it cited. It was amazing uh, that they went back in many, many years. They took out, um, they took at references and asked experts for their opinions. And I'm sure they could have gone into a whole heck of a lot more detail and probably did in some other report. But um, this, I thought, was a good overview of um, why we should have, you know, consider um, certain color temperatures for, for uh, LED lights and why we should uh, continue to shield them as much as possible. Um, it just, it was a very good overview. Um, but, uh, just now looking through the references, uh, the references all look pretty good and majority of them are really quite recent. Remember them all, you know, 2016, published 2016, so. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I would, I would, um, I could put this up on the screen share too. I think I have the website from which this came, and I could um, make offer this as something people could read as well. Um, it really is an eye opener. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> All right. Um, I I think I'm going to look at the questions now um, over here on my question app, and it's really oh, gosh, it's getting this thing that. Getting the apps to pop up as a bear and a half. I don't know why it doesn't do that here. I think I have to, there we go. Whoop. And we have the Q&A. Let's see, I'm gonna ask the questions. And, okay. All right, well, um, let's see, how would we continue to, uh, to use this beyond what we've already discussed in terms of um, issues of glare. There's two types of glare, mostly, that are associated with this activity, at least. One is called disability glare, and one is called... Discomfort glare. Discomfort. Can you tell them the differences? Sure. So, um, so discomfort glare um, is, is really more of a nuisance type of glare. So you have uh, a very strongly white LED street lamp near your house and it shines inside your living room or something and you need very thick currents to block it. Um, that, that would be an example of discomfort glare. Um, is that someone else agree with that? What about um, disability glare? So disability, disability glare is where things get dangerous. Um, these are the street lamps out um, on the road that uh, are actually physically blinding. Um, and, and they create this, um, what was it, the veil of illuminance is what we discussed earlier. Um, they're just too bright, they're not covered, so they shine directly into your eye, which can of course blind you, and if you're moving at 60 miles per hour, um, it's very clear how this can be a problem. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure of any other um, examples. I, I think this is the most prominent and most important example. Good explanation, I think. Um, so these are the two that we try to exemplify in our uh, activity. And I don't see any more questions to be honest with you so, <laughs> so far. And if you could think of any, Mike, that would be helpful too. How are you going to use this activity in, in your neighborhood? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I think this is a, an activity that, um, I mean, we do like a lot of, public outreach at events and I think this is a good activity that you can do in at, a, at an event where you know there are lots of people milling around because um, a lot of the other activities you really require you to be in a room where you can turn out lights um, but I think this is a good one for big public events mm -hmm. we still need to turn out lights for this one so. Well, uh, it depend, depends how far you want to take it, I think. Um, at big, like, big public outreach events, often you're only going to get people for maybe 10 minutes. 
Um, you know, they're not, they're there because, you know, they, out of enjoyment. Um, and so they don't particularly want to be doing a scientific experiment. Um, generally it's only a handful of people who are prepared to do that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So do you have this inside or outside or how do you usually have your activities? Uh, generally inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, generally so inside. If you had a room without windows though, it could be easy to turn off, you know, well not turn them off all the way, but you have the lights as dim as you can possibly stand yeah. it. Often these are like big public auditoriums. So oh. mm -hmm. wow. yeah. they're not going to let you turn the lights out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, this, it gets kind of hard then with this particular activity. We, um, we, we have done all six activities in the same room, same large room. Um, but, um, it's easier to do half of them, which is this one, the night sky one, and the uh, light trespass one, when the room is darker. So you could do, say, half and half, right? Um, mm. And um, it's, it's, so it's easier to do that um, <laughs> uh, with, with a, you know, no classroom at all is going to be pitch black. There's no way you're going to get a classroom pitch black. But... Um, if you have it, it see that we, we purposely kept our, our room a little bit dimmer here. Um, if you probably had it a little bit darker than what we have in our room here, we only have two uh, tiny, um, actually, um, incandescent lights on above us right now um, in this room. Um, and that's about it. And if you can make it a little bit darker, uh, that would be to your benefit. Of course, we have our monitors on as well, so it's making it pretty bright at the moment. Um, but uh, similarly with the night sky and the um, light trespass, it really does have to be a bit, a little bit darker. And, but the, with the other activities, the animal one, the energy one, and um, the safety one, you're actually going around measuring the, uh, the, with the safety one, you're measuring your light levels. So you're doing it pretty much with the lights on. Um, and that's, those are the three activities you could do, with, you know, so we usually, uh, do half and switch them, you know, to, so you have conditions either with the lights off or conditions with the lights on. And, uh, and again, it doesn't have to be pitch black, but it does do, um, it demonstrates better what's going on when mm -hmm. the lights are as dark as you can get, you know, the room is as dark as you can get it. So, um, yeah, and I, and just do the best you can. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's pretty awesome either way. I mean, if you have um, a light that does show, uh, it's pretty strong, a strong mag light, uh, and you can you can show that glare even with um, you know lights a bit on more than the typical situation we have for this activity. Then I think it'll work. It just depends on how good your mag light is. <laughs> I think so. Anyway, so that's good. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so, okay, no worries. What's that? I was just saying, that's okay. No, no worries. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me know when you're going to do the glare activity, okay? Okay. Yep. Take pictures. Everybody out there who's a uh, kit recipient that's going to be watching this, either with the YouTube that's produced from this um, uh, Google Hangout, Google Plus Hangout, excuse me, um, if you have uh, events that you're doing, just let me know. A quick email, one-liner. I'm doing this event with these people on this date. Um, you might tell me how many people attended. You might send me a, a couple of photographs. I, we, keep, we keep all these things. We really would appreciate because um, it helps us to advocate the project uh, to show how well or, or maybe, how, maybe how well it's not going. I don't know, but uh, hopefully how well it's going. And um, and uh, photos say a lot, and uh, so we do appreciate them. I'm actually writing right now a an NOAO article uh, on the Quality Learning Teaching Kit professional development. That is actually what we're doing right now with the Google Hangouts and what we've uh, you know have uh, accomplished with the tutorial videos, which really did turn out quite well, and they're very informative. So I hope you all get to watch them. They're only between 
7 and 14 minutes long. Half of them are on the shorter end and half of them are on that longer end. But still, they're short for 14 minutes or 7 minutes. And um, they're very instructive. So please, um, we can't travel to you if you're on the other side of the world like Mike is in Australia. But um, it would be nice if uh, we could take advantage of both the Google Plus Hangouts where you can ask questions. Hint, 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 hint. Um, having, you know, seen, hint, 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 the video tutorial on whatever particular activity the uh, Google Hangout is um, addressing. So please, if you would, um, on the remaining, I don't know how, how many we have, three and a half topics, um, we have um, at least three more in the three next weeks uh, on, the, on the other three activities that we have left, as well as one more of these uh, Hangouts on Thursday for the other half of the world. So, you know, the people from Europe, the people from uh, Africa, as well the, as the Americas are invited to the one, to the uh, Google Plus Hangout on uh, Thursday. But we're hoping again, I mean, it's a very minimal amount of requirements we're asking to for you to look at the video, come up with one or two questions, and feel free to ask them. Um, if it's going to help you in any way to do the activities with your audience, that's what we're here for. So um, anyway, that's my soapbox for the, for the evening. <laughs> well, it's morning for a lot of you, but it's evening for us here in the States. So. Uh, it's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's still cool. time the next day for you, right? Sir? It's still yeah, Monday. That's right. Yeah, it's really cool. It's Tuesday for you, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> cool. That was, yeah. I, yeah. Anyway, so um, I don't mean to belabor something that uh, we have um, addressed a lot of the issues that we wanted to in this particular Hangout. Um, I could try, if you would bear with me, to find that uh, reference for you for the uh, AMA report. So if you just allow me to do that for a second, I could put that as a screen share, and you all will have that. Um, okay. Here it is. Okay, I got it from somebody's... Hmm. Darn it. I might have to go back on to my mailer. So just bear with me for a second. I will look for the AMA report. And it was from, I think it was from right here. Yes. Yes. OK. So, no, we got it as a PDF file, but I'm sure if you Google it, um, it would come up as a report. So if you look at the American Medical Association website, I think you might find it <clears throat> on their website, so it shouldn't be too bad. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I got it as a, as a PDF. <laughs> Um, I wonder if I could, it's not screen sharing, it's not, I'll think about how to do that. Maybe we could put it on the QLT webpage. Anyways, okay, so thank you so much. And I would also, as, um, as Mike uh, alluded to, look at some of the newer references that are in that report. Uh, that might be, again, some eye opener for, for those who want to learn more about Blair and its effects on our health and how to address it in terms of solutions. So that would be good too. Right. Um, I'm looking down our list of points to hit and I think we've done all we can so we might actually end up um, ending sooner. And I think that's about it. Do you have any final things that you both want to say? Anything else you can think of? I think we've heard all of you well. Mm -hmm. And then how about you, Mike? I'm fine. Yep. I'm fine. Okay. So do feel free to uh, ask questions either um, by emailing me, and that is um, C Walker. That's for Connie Walker, C Walker, at N as in Nancy, O A O dot edu. 
a number of people have already uh, asked some wonderful questions about the kit in general. And, um, and as a reminder, please to give us feedback. You can also give me feedback at that particular email address, cwalker at noao.edu. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from all of you, um, all 150 people that I have on our list, and uh, for the almost 90 uh, kits that we've passed out, um, and a few more that we are aiming to uh, pass out um, for the total of 100 kits that we have made by Ricky and a bunch of other students that we have here working at the National Observatory. And uh, on behalf of the National Observatory, I want to thank everybody out there. Uh, keep up the good work, um, keep using those kits, and keep uh, letting us know when you use them. And thank you, Mike, for joining us very, very much. Um, it's always a pleasure. Enjoy, enjoyed it. Thanks, Connie. Um, say it again, please. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And um, I look forward to hearing um, if you are working with Judith Bailey down there in um, Melbourne uh, with the kits at some time in the future, because you um have two of those yeah. kids there right now yeah, right. Okay. yeah um, i'm sure she's looking forward to that as well um okay well thank you very much everybody and uh we're going to be signing off now um, okay and right. so thursday and the ut is 15 hours gmt the hours i should say 15 hours gmt on thursday is when our um our next who will hang out on the same subject as for the other half of the world. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Craig. Um, Thanks. I got a bolt to university, so. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm sure you have a lot to do. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time. Bye.